Okay, so hi everyone. Today we're going to be talking about an important neurological emergency and a demyelinating disorder of the peripheral nervous system, that is Guillain-Barre syndrome. So, what is the definition of GBS? So, basically, it's an acute, severe, autoimmune, fulminant demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy. So, this is the definition of GBS, and the full expansion is landry guillain barr stroll syndrome. So, in case they can ask you this question to confuse you, this is the full expansion of GBS, that is landry guillain barr stroll syndrome. So, regarding the epidemiology, so we have around 1 to 4 cases for every 100,000 population annually, and males are slightly more affected than females, and predominantly it affects adults compared to children. Very important. So, what are antecedent ev events in guillain barr syndrome? So, most of the time you will have some sort of antecedent event in GBS that triggers GBS and usually this takes the form of an infectious agent. Usually this takes the form of an infectious agent and 70% of the times in GBS you are going to have such an antecedent infection which precedes Guillain-Barr syndrome by 1 to 3 weeks and the infectious process can take the form of a GI tract infection or a respiratory tract infection more common being gastrointestinal infections and the most common triggering agent is going to be Campylobacter jejuni in 20 to 30 20 to 30 percent of cases. This is a very important MCQ. The others are human herpes virus, cytomegalovirus, Epstein Barr virus, HIV. Very, very important. Okay, so that's why it's very important that you uh, check for the retroviral status in all patients presenting with GBS. Then hepatitis E, Zika virus, a newer infectious agent. This is an important MCQ. Zika virus can also trigger GBS. Mycoplasma pneumoniae, Lyme disease, influenza vaccine. Again, important question. And your old type of rabies vaccine, which is based on neural antigens, that can trigger GBS. And certain autoimmune diseases like SLE and malignancies like lymphoma. And among lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma is more associated with GBS. So now coming to the different types of Guillain-Barr syndrome. So we have four important major types of GBS. And in each type, you have some sort of local variant. We look into that also. So the most commonly encountered type of GBS is going to be AIDP. That is acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. So we have a localized variant of AIDP. That is a facial variant where you have bilateral facial nerve palsy along with paresthesia. So this is known as facial diplegia and paresthesia. Next, you can have axonal varieties of GBS. You can have axonal varieties of GBS. Remember that axonal varieties have a poor prognosis compared to demyelinating varieties. Axonal uh, varieties of uh, GBS have a poor prognosis. They have a delayed recovery and usually an incomplete recovery. So let's go into the axonal types. So we have AMAN that is acute motor axonal neuropathy and a localized variant of AMAN is known as acute pharyngeal cervicobrachial neuropathy. So this is a localized type of AMAN. In case you are also going to have sensory involvement in axonal uh, types, it's known as AMSEN, that is acute motor sensory axonal neuropathy. And then a very, very important variant that is Miller Fisher syndrome. So, Miller Fisher syndrome is characterized by A reflexia. So, you will have A reflexia without weakness, and then you will have ataxia, and then you are going to have ophthalmoplegia. You are going to have ophthalmoplegia. Remember that this ophthalmoplegia is going to be complete. You are going to have both external as well as, well as internal ophthalmoplegia. That means even your pupillary reaction is going to be involved. Okay, so in Miller Fisher syndrome is classically associated with antibodies to GQ1B. Okay, that's why Miller Fisher syndrome and its variants come, to, come under a spectrum of disorders which is known as anti GQ1B antibody syndromes and they comprise 5% of all GBS cases. So Miller Fisher syndrome sometimes you might not, might not have all the three classical features. So you can have incomplete forms where you have an acute ophthalmoparesis without ataxia and you can also have an acute ataxic neuropathy without ophthalmoplegia. And very important MCQ question, the CNS variant of anti-GQ1B antibody sp uh, spectrum of disorders is because of encephalitis. So it's very simple, basically you have a patient with Miller Fisher syndrome also having altered sensorium, presenting also with altered sensorium. So this is known as because of encephalitis, it's a CNS variant of MFS and it's an important MCQ question. Now coming to the different antibodies and different types of GBS. So the most commonly encountered type AADP are going to have anti-GM1 antibodies. Okay. So all the antibodies are important MCQ questions. So make sure you remember them. And then for your axonal variety, that is acute motor axonal neuropathy, you're going to have anti-GD 1A antibodies. And for Miller Fisher syndrome, as we discussed earlier, anti-GQ1B, this is a very, very important frequently asked MCQ question. 
and then we have a variety of amen as we discussed earlier we have a localized variety of or variant of amen that is known as acute pharyngeal cervical brachial neuropathy here you're going to have anti gt 1a antibodies so remember the four antibodies and where they going to come next coming to the clinical features so the classical uh, classical description of gbs is going to be a ascending flaccid paralysis classically described as an ascending flaccid paralysis so it's an acute rapidly evolving areflexic or flaccid motor paralysis which may or may not have sensory features so we'll discuss the clinical features of gbs under motor symptoms sensory symptoms and autonomic symptoms so the major clinical feature is going to be the motor symptoms so as we described earlier you're going to have an ascending flaccid or areflexic paralysis classically described as rubbery legs by the patient and the progression is going to be very fast gbs is going to evolve over hours to a few days and by the time the patient reaches around 4 weeks so by 4 weeks is going to be plateau so after this 4 weeks usually there is no further progression after this so very very important when does gbs plateau it happens at 4 weeks of onset and obviously your uh, deep tone and reflexes are going to be lost and you're going to have bilateral element facial nerve palsy okay one of the most common uh, cranial nerve involved in gbs is going to be your facial nerve and you're going to have a bilateral bilateral element facial nerve palsy or facial diparesis or facial diplegia you can also have other cranial nerve involvement you can have bulbar weakness in those conditions patient will have difficulty in managing secretions and might even develop aspiration pneumonia and very important 30% of the patients are going to require mechanical ventilation that's why it's very important that you manage gbs patients in an icu setup okay so 30% of the patients are going to require mechanical ventilation that's an important mcq next come to the sensory symptoms so sensory symptoms aren't as pronounced as the motor symptoms but there are a few important points over here we look at it so since it's a polyradiculopathy it's a polyradicular neuropathy they're going to have pain in the neck shoulders in the back and diffusely over the spine in more than 50% of the cases and also commonly patients will describe tingling sensation or paresthesias in the extremities and remember that your sensations carried by your large fibers are going to be predominantly involved like proprioception vibration sense these are the sensations which are going to be lost whereas your sensations carried by small fibers like pain and temperature are usually spared most of the time they're going to be spared So remember, you're going to lose your large fiber sensations, whereas your small fiber sensations are going to be preserved or spared. Now, coming to the very important, that is autonomic features. So autonomic features are very pronounced in GBS. So it could present as a wide fluctuation in BP. So sudden hypotension, sudden hypertension. Patient can present with flushing, loss of sweating, or in contrast to that, patient can even have profuse sweating also. Okay, and patient will also develop cardiac arrhythmias. This is also a very important fact. Why? patient should be monitored in the icu because these things can be monitored only over there because the fluctuations in heart rate and bp occur over minutes it occurs very rapidly so again very important manage gbs patients in the icu now how are you going to diagnose gbs so gbs you're going to diagnose it with a classical clinical, uh, clinical presentation and electrophysiological study main investigation of choice uh, which is going to help you diagnose is electro electrophysiological testing so you're going to do a nerve conduction study so for aidp which is the demyelinating type you're going to have prolonged defib latencies prolonged distal latencies and reduced amplitude of your compound muscle action potentials whereas in your axonal variants you're not going to have any sort of conduction slowing or any prolongation of the distant latencies but you will have predominantly a reduced amplitude of compound muscle action potentials and in case you have a sensory involvement in axonal variants that is your acute motor sensory axon neuropathy you can also have reduced snaps that is sensory nerve action potentials now coming to csf findings in gbs so i think most of you are acquainted to this term that is cytoalbuminic dissociation so what happens here in the csf the protein is going to increase protein is going to increase but there is no increase in cells cells are going to be normal there's no increase in cell so this is known as cytoalbuminergic dissociation so you have a raised csf protein usually 100 to 1000 mg per deciliter and no pleocytosis that is cells are not going to increase but in case you're going to encounter pleocytosis very important check the retroviral status of the patient and in case you happen to take an mri usually uh, usually it's not taken you don't need it to diagnose gbs but if you happen to take an mri you can see gadolinium enhancement of the cauda equina roots So important question what is the diagnostic criteria for golden bar syndrome it's brighton's criteria okay so it's brighton's criteria so remember this it's an important question all right now we'll come to treatment 
So GBS is one of the few neurological conditions where it's very time sensitive. It's very important that you diagnose it early and start treatment as soon as possible. Because after a certain uh, period of time or after a certain phase of the disease, treatment is not going to work. Okay, so you have to start it as early as possible. And after two weeks of onset, immunotherapy might not be effective. And once the patient reaches the plateau phase, once the patient reaches the plateau phase at four weeks of onset, there is no use of immunotherapy unless the patient is going to have ongoing clinical evolution of signs and symptoms, which is rare. Usually after four weeks, there's not going to be any further progression. So what are the main treatment modalities for GBS? So number one is intravenous immunoglobulin and the other one is going to be plasma exchange. So we look into both of them in detail. So coming to intravenous immunoglobulin, IVIG. So it's actually preferable to plasma exchange because IVIG is usually readily available and it's easy to administer. Whereas plasma exchange will require a central line and in certain variants like uh, acute motor axonal neuropathy and Miller-Fisher syndrome, IVIG is actually preferred to plasma exchange. So the total dose of IVIG is going to be 2 grams per day. So you split this as 400 mg per kg per day which is given over 5 days. And the mechanism of action is not very clear but is usually due to anti-idiotypic antibodies. So what are the issues with IVIG? So the problem is you can't use it if the patient's having either an acute kidney injury or a chronic kidney disease. If the patient's having raised renal parameters, you can't give IVIG. And the other problem is per se IVIG by itself can cause AKI by causing osmotic nephropathy. So it's contraindicated when the renal parameters are deranged and per se it can derange the renal parameters. It can cause AKI due to osmotic nephropathy and very important it can cause aseptic meningitis very very important mcq ivag can cause aseptic meningitis and rarely it can cause anaphylaxis but whenever a patient is developing anaphylaxis to ivag you have to rule out selective iga deficiency so that's very important now coming to plasma exchange so plasma exchange the dose is 40 to 50 ml per kg four to five times given over seven to ten days Okay, so is there any role of glucocorticoids? The answer is going to be no. There is absolutely no role of steroids or glucocorticoids in GBS. Alright, so as I had emphasized earlier, GBS is managed in the ICU. So what are the supportive management for GBS other than immunotherapy? So remember 30% of the cases, again this is repeating, this is a very important MCQ, 30% of GBS patients will require mechanical ventilation. So how do you know whether the patient is going to require ventilation is you have to monitor the vital capacity. So when the vital capacity is less than 10 ml per kg, that time you'll have to consider mechanical ventilation. And since the patient is going to have significant autonomic disturbance, you have to monitor the heart rate and blood pressure and DVT and pulmonary embolism prophylaxis. Since the patient is going to be immobile, you will have to give DVT and pulmonary embolism prophylaxis with heparin and limb physiotherapy and chest physiotherapy. Okay, so this is about, I think I have covered most of the important points on GBS. Okay, thank you.